tile under the mouse. Today we're starting the first step leading to the interactivity between the user and the grid. And by that I mean detecting which tile is under the mouse cursor. And then we'll be able to use this tile to affect our grid or to execute any other kind of actions. So let's get to it. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, the first step is to get access to the mouse cursor position in the world. And then we're going to convert this world location into a grid index instead. But first I'm gonna start by adding a few things in the tab grid in the debug menu. So open the tab grid. Here I'm gonna go at the bottom right here and I'm actually going to add two new lines at the bottom. So I'm going to duplicate this one twice. Then I'm going to rename my text. So instead of bottom left, I'm going to name it the mouse location. Then I'm gonna use the same thing for the checkbox. So checkbox underscore mouse location. And same thing for the text on the right. So text underscore mouse location. And for this text, I'm actually going to change the font a little bit. I'm going to make it smaller. I'm gonna make it eight instead of 10, just because I know it's gonna overflow a little bit. Okay, next checkbox, I'm going to change the text for over the tile, change the checkbox name to checkbox underscore over the tile. And for the text, I'm going to name it text underscore over the tile. And for this one, I'm going to remove the last minus 999 at the end because it's gonna be a vector to the Perfect, we can now compile, save, and go in the graph. And we're gonna go in the draw debug line function right here. In there, I'm just going to move everything out of the way a little bit. I'm going to add a sequence at the beginning of the function. I'm gonna copy paste it and move it at the bottom and connect it like so. We are going to do all of our code right here at the bottom. That way we're not blocked by anything else. And we can focus on the new code. But before we can add some code in there, we have to go create the function we're gonna need. And we're gonna start with the function that gives us the world position of the mouse in the world. And since we want to use some line trace to see if the mouse is over the grid or not, we're gonna create that function inside the grid itself. So I'm gonna go in entry, I'm gonna go in core, grid, and open BP grid. And I'm going to create a new function. Name it uh, get cursor location on grid. And this is how it's gonna go. I'm gonna start with uh, get player controller. And since it's possible that we wanna change the player index later on, I'm just gonna pass it as input. Then we wanna check if there's a tile under the mouse cursor. So we're gonna do a line trace. So get hit result under cursor by channel, the first one. For the trace channel, we wanna use the grid because this is the channel that is only used by the grid. So that's the one we wanna use. And we don't wanna do a trace complex. Then we're gonna do an if to see if uh, the result touched something. And if it's the case, we're gonna return the location. So return, and we want to access the location. So break the it result, expand this right here, get the location from it and drop it onto the return node. And then we can collapse this. Okay, so that was easy, but what if the mouse is not over the grid? Well, I think it would be nice to also return a position. The position of the mouse that could be over the grid if there was a tile under it. And by that I mean the plane of the grid. So we're gonna try to check if the mouse is over the plane of the grid, and if it's the case, we're gonna return that position instead. Which means that even though there's no tile there, we're gonna be able to select the tile as if it was there, and maybe do some action with it. For example, if you want to add a tile to the grid, well, you can't really trace to see where you want to add that tile because the tile is not there yet. So that's why we're still gonna return a position, a position that will be used to execute actions, even though we don't really have a tile under the mouse cursor yet. Anyway, let's just do it. And for that, I'm just gonna start by the player controller and do a convert mouse location to world space to get the mouse position in world space. And then we're gonna do another kind of line trace, but this time it's gonna be a line plane intersection. So we're gonna kind the line trace forward from the mouse position until it touches something. And the something is the plane right here that we have to define. So let's define it. Make plane from point and normal. And for the position of the plane, we're gonna use the center of the grid. And for the normal, it's gonna be zero, zero, and one because we want the plane to look up. And for the line N, we're gonna do the same thing as we do for any other line trace. So we're gonna combine the location and the direction. Get the direction, multiply it by a float. The float's gonna be a huge number, so 9999, pretty much infinity. And then you can add the world location with the direction, which is going to give you the forward vector under the mouse. Then you can connect all that together. And same thing we did before, if it touched something, we're gonna do an if here, connect it like so. 
return the location, so return the intersection. And if it's not the case, we're just gonna return an invalid value. So let's say minus 909, minus 909, minus 909, which is never gonna happen for real. But anyway, that's it for this function that gives us the mouse position on the grid. Then we can compile and go attach that in the type grid right here. So I'm just gonna grab the grid from the left, call the new function, so get um, cursor location on grid. The player index is gonna be zero for now because we don't really care. Then we're gonna start by updating our text with the new location. So get the text on the left, text mouse location and do a set text on it and pass it the location. And then we're also going to add a debug sphere just to visualize the mouse cursor in world space. And to do that, I'm just gonna do the same thing we did over here. So I'm just gonna copy all those nodes from the middle right here. I'm just gonna paste them here connect them like so. And we wanna start by checking if our checkbox is checked and the new checkbox that we wanna use is the checkbox underscore mouse location. Let's plug that in. And then for the position of the debug sphere, we're gonna use the location of the get cursor location right here. So we'll just connect it and we can delete those two nodes. Then for the radius, maybe we can set it to, let's say 15, the segment, I don't know, five, doesn't really matter. Uh, the line color, we can make it, I don't know, something like yellowish. And for the thickness, I'd say maybe five. And that's it, I think it's enough to see something in editor. So let's compile, save and go play. If I move my mouse in the world, I can see my position is updating on the left, so that's good. And if I check my mouse location checkbox, I can see that I have a yellow dot that's following my mouse. It's a little bit laggy because I'm running it at 10 FPS, uh, like all my other debug lines, but that's good enough to see the result. So this is how it looks, I'm over the grid, so that's good. What if I check my checkbox, uh, even though the grid is not there, I still have my mouse location as if it were on the grid, so that's good. And that way I can decide to add tile right here or right there or right here if I want to. And the most important part, I'm just gonna increase the tile count just to have access to those tiles right here, is the line trace working. So I'm just gonna move my mouse cursor right on top of this one, yeah. And you can see it snap from the bottom tile to the top tile, based if the line trace touched the grid or not, like so. And maybe if I zoom it, we can see it a little bit better, but yeah, tuk, 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 tuk. So the line trace also works, so it gives us access to the height of the tiles also. So the next step is to do the over tiles, so I'm just gonna stop and go directly in the grid. Okay, so to get the index that is under the cursor, we're gonna create a new function, a function that converts the grid location right here to a grid index. So let's do that. I'm gonna create a new function, which I'm gonna name get the tile index from world location. And as the function name says, it's gonna take a location as input, so a vector, which I'm gonna name location, and gonna return an index, so an int point, which I'm gonna name index. And this function is going to be a little bit more complex because it takes into account the grid shape and the size of the tiles currently in the world. But the first step is always to convert the world location into a grid space location. So let's just do that first. I'm gonna minus the world location with another vector, which is the bottom left corner of the grid. And then we can promote it to a local variable, which I'm gonna name location on grid and connect it to the beginning of the function like so. And then we're gonna get our grid shape and do a switch on the grid shape. And actually we can directly do the none by connecting the return, splitting the index and returning an invalid index, which is minus 909, minus 909, something like that. Doesn't really matter because it should not happen. Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna start with the square because it's the simplest one. And the first step is to get the location on grid. Then I'm going to make sure that it is snapped to the size of the tiles. So I'm just gonna snap vector to vector and pass it to the grid tile size. That way we're not gonna be in between tiles. We're gonna be in the middle of the tile. Then we can convert it to a vector 2D, so to vector 2D, because we're not gonna need the Z value. And then we can promote that into a local variable just for now, which I'm gonna name snapped location on grid and connect it in my square. And then from that location on the grid, the last thing we have to do is to simply calculate how many tiles there is between the bottom left corner and that specific location. So that's super easy to do. I'm just going to go at the end, return here, and we're gonna get the snap location on grid. We're gonna divide by the tile size, so divide by a vector 2D, get the, the grid tile size, and connect it. And that's it. So from the bottom left corner, we're getting the snap grid location and then we're dividing it to get how many tiles there is. And that's it, we can simply connect it to the return. So that was for the square, it is pretty easy. 
But for the triangle and the hexagon, it's a little bit more complex and I don't really want to spend too much time on the math behind it. So I'm just gonna give them to you. I'm just gonna scroll here and paste all that. Here we go. And we're gonna look at it together. I'm just gonna start by connecting the triangle to the bottom one and the hexagon. And we're gonna focus on the triangle first because it's simpler. So same thing as for the square, we're getting the location on the grid and snapping it to a vector. But this time we are taking the grid tile size and we are dividing it by two in the y axis because the tiles are closer together when we are on a triangle grid. And then from that snap location on grid, we are gonna do the same thing that we did for the square. So we're dividing by the grid tile size, but we're gonna compensate for what we did before. So since we divided by two the tile size, we are going to multiply it by two right here just to compensate. And then we can return the index. So that's for the triangle. It's not too, too complex. So that's not too bad, but the hexagon is a little bit messier. So let's go look at it. I'm gonna go up right here, which is connected to the hexagon. So more snap location connected to the hexagon. Same thing right here, we're snapping it to a vector, but we are multiplying them both. The first one is multiplied by 1, 2, and 1, and for the second one it's 0 0.75, 0 0.25, and 1. Which gives us the location on the grid that we're then gonna use to determine the index. Actually, no, we are first creating a temp index, here. Which is also a vector 2D, and we access it by dividing the location on grid by the tile size multiplied by 0.75 and 1, just to compensate, again. But here's the fun part. For the hexagon, since every other row is offset a little bit, we have to do a second pass on the index and affect it differently if the x value is even or odd. So we're just gonna compare and see if the x is even right here. And this is what we're gonna do. So in both cases, it's not the x that matters, it's the y. The x can simply be returned as is. But for the y, in the case that the x is even, we want to divide it by two, round it, and then multiply it by two. And then we can simply return it at the end of the function. But in the case that the x is not even, we're gonna take the y, divide it by 2 still, we're gonna floor it instead of rounding it, then multiply by 2, and finally offset it by 1 in the end, so plus 1. And then truncate it and return it. And all that should give us the index of the tile that is under the mouse cursor. So perfect. Before testing all that, I'm just going to quickly do a last function. I'm going to name it get tile index under cursor and we're gonna use it to combine both functions we just created. So we're gonna start by calling the get cursor location. We're gonna pass it the index, and then we're gonna use the return of that location to call the second function, like so. And then we can simply connect the index at the end in the return node. So return connect the index, perfect. So we now just have one function to call if we wanna get the index from the player index right here. I'm just gonna compile and go in tab grid to connect the debug settings. Here I'm gonna get the grid, call the new function, so get the tile index under cursor. We can keep the same player index, we can connect it like so. Uh, to set the text, I'm just gonna copy paste those two nodes right here and replace the text by the text I wanna use on the left, so text underscore over tile, I'm gonna replace it like so. We can connect the index directly to the text, so I'm just gonna convert it to the string first, so to string, and then we can connect it to the text like so. Then we're gonna do the same thing for the checkbox, so I'm just gonna copy that, paste it right here, replace the checkbox with the checkbox we have on the left, so checkbox underscore over tile. Then for the debug line, we're not gonna use a sphere this time, we're gonna do a box, so draw debug box. And then we need to feed it the center, which we don't really have right now because we just have an index, so what I'm gonna do is get the grid, and we're gonna fetch it from the tile data. So get tiles, get grid tiles. Then I'm gonna do a find, pass it the index returned by the function, which we can then break, split the transform, and connect the location to the center of the box, like so. But before doing that, I'm just gonna make sure that I found something in the tile. So if the tile exists in the data, if so, I'm just gonna do an if right here, and then we're gonna draw something, otherwise we're not. So for the rest of the debug box, we're just gonna use, let's say, 35, 35, and five for the extent. For the color, I'm gonna use something like a bright red. No rotation, the duration is gonna be 0.1 like any other debug line we have right here. And then the thickness, let's say five. And I think that's it. We have everything we need to go test all that. So this is how it looks, and I'm gonna compile, save, and go in the grid. Press play. 
Here, if I move my mouse on the screen, I can see that my hover tile is updating. So that's good. My index is updating and it seems fine. In the bottom left corner, it's zero. Then one, two, three. Okay, that's good. And the same thing when I go the other direction. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. That's great. Then I can check my two checkboxes and see if it works. If I'm outside of the grid here, I just have my yellow dot. And if I go on my grid, yeah, I have my red orange box like that. Okay, that's good. That seems to work. Uh, if I move around my tile, it stays in the middle, so that's good. It snaps perfectly in the middle if I switch between the tiles, so that's good. Uh, and let's say if I generate my grid based on the environment and scale it back up. Uh, now, okay, that seems good. If I'm above ground or underground, it seems to work. It works also even if I'm under the tile right here, so I'm under the floor, but it still works because I'm tracing to a plane that is at the same level as the grid, and then it detects that there's a tile above it, so it should return that tile, and it works perfectly, so that's good, and it works fine for all the different levels, great. Now let's try the other tile types, so I'm gonna go in hexagon, uh, go in the hexagon grid, and then, oh, okay, here's my hexagon, same thing, if I follow the edges of my tiles, it works perfectly fine, it's not perfect perfect actually but whatever it's good enough I think uh, same thing here if I'm over the tiles they all work perfectly good and same thing if I'm outside of the grid I still have my square because it's part of the data but if it wasn't it will not be there okay good so that's good for the hexagon I'm just gonna go do the same thing for the triangle so show the triangle level and the triangle grid and same thing, if I move around the tile, it works. There's a little bit of a bleeding spot between the two tiles here in the corners, but whatever, we don't really care about that. We just care about the middle part, I guess, of the triangle, and we can always improve that in the future. That's not a big deal. And I'm actually satisfied with the result for now, so that's good enough for me. If you have any suggestions to improve it, just let me know and we're gonna do it. Uh, but I think that's gonna be it for now. We did pretty much everything I wanted to do today, so that's good. And I'm gonna see you in the next one. Bye-bye.